If you find these videos helpful, please consider supporting Ad Ohms and The Bald Engineer on Patreon. Previously on Ad Ohms, we drew a custom Arduino schematic in KiCad, laid out the Pyramid Duino printed circuit board, and sent our boards off to be manufactured. In this tutorial, we are going to build and turn on the very first Pyramid Duino. My name is James and I am The Bald Engineer. We have an epic amount of stuff to cover, so let's go pick and place, starting with a very special introduction sequence. In this episode, we're going to do three main things. First, we'll solder parts to the PCB, then debug any issues, and finally, load a bootloader onto the microcontroller. Before we get started, I wanna say a big thank you to Oshpark for providing these beautiful purple PCBs. I have used their service for years because they provide professional grade boards at a hobby level price. Please check them out at oshpark.com. One option to load parts on the board could be using a soldering iron, but that would mean soldering one part at a time. We could also use a reflow process. Now in a professional setting, we would use an oven, which is this huge conveyor belt that solders the entire board at once. We're going to do something similar with this toaster oven. I built a controller box that converts it into a reflow oven, but more details on that later. For now, we need to go put parts on our board. Let's start assembling our boards. Here, you can see that I'm applying solder paste to the PCB. This paste holds the parts in place until the oven turns it into liquid solder. The stencil applies paste only to the exposed pads. In professional manufacturing, there's a machine that picks up the parts and places them on the board. I have to use tweezers. Before starting, I arrange my parts in a column with the help of double-sided tape. I start at the bottom and put the same part on all three boards before moving on to the next part. Even though the LEDs have a cathode mark, I always check their terminals with my multimeter. When the anode and cathode are connected correctly, the LED will light up. These boards may look a little bit messy, but they are ready for the oven. You might have noticed that some of the parts are not on their pads straight. Well, later on, I'm going to use a magic trick to fix that. The boards go into my super duper advanced reflow oven. The middle board has a thermal couple taped to it. That thermal couple connects to my reflow oven controller box. That box controls the oven's AC power, turning it on and off to control the temperature inside. Boards that go through a reflow process follow a curve. First is the preheat to bring the temperatures above room temperature. The soak stage allows parts to reach the same temperature and activates the flux and the solder paste. After soaking comes the hard part. The oven has to ramp up to the reflow peak temperature as fast as possible without overshooting. Then there's another soak or dwell time, which makes sure that all of the paste converts to liquid solder. And finally, the boards need to cool down. If you decide to build or use your own reflow oven, keep in mind that the cool down stage has a maximum cooling rate. Make sure the boards don't cool faster than a few degrees per second. If they cool too fast, parts like ceramic capacitors can actually crack. In other words, don't just open the oven's door. Open it slowly. While the boards cool down, let's zoom in and watch the last few seconds again. Here, the paste is still a paste. Watch the parts in this area. They're going to start moving. As the paste turns liquid, surface tension pulls the parts onto the exposed pads. Let's repeat that a few times. This action is the magic trick I mentioned before. It makes surface mount soldering way easier since you don't have to be careful with how you place the components. Don't worry, science will fix the boards for you. Next, some solder balls start forming on the IC pins. The last part to transition is the crystal, which may have too much paste on it. Now that the boards are cool, let's move on. Using my multimeter's continuity mode, I check to see if there is a short between VCC and ground. This is always my first check because, oh crap, there is a dead short. Well, that's why it's my first check. 
My experience says it is probably on the IC since the pins are so close to each other. If we look closely at the QFN, you can see that there are multiple pins shorted together. This is actually an easy fix. I just need to dab the pins with a fine tip and solder braid to remove that extra solder. Even though we fixed a short on the supply pins, there could be another one on the board. And so for that reason, a bench supply that can limit current is very helpful. Here, I am limiting my supply current to 100 milliamps. If something draws more current than this, the supply will step in and hopefully save the circuit. Let's hit on and see what happens. Okay, good. The board is only drawing a few milliamps, meaning there are no major shorts. However, the LED didn't turn on. So we need to go measure some voltages. We are getting five volts on the five volt pin and zero volts on the 3.3 volt pin. Wait, that actually explains the LED since it's connected to the 3.3 volt regulator. While measuring the LDO's enable pin, I noticed that the voltage would hover between 0.9 and 1.2 volts. When it got close to 1.2 volts, I noticed the LED would flicker. Now this flicker got me thinking. When I designed the board, I read in the 3.3 volt regulator's datasheet that it includes an enable pull-down resistor, which I thought meant it was enabled by default. Well, it turns out if I had read the datasheet closer, like on the first page, I would have realized it is disabled by default and requires voltage to turn it on. I wrote up a long explanation on my blog about that. As you can see in the PCB design, I left the enable pin disconnected. While I can update this file, I cannot easily add a trace to the finished board. I can, however, add a jumper wire to fix it. Fortunately, I keep this small gauge wire around for minor repairs like this one. I'll just add a jumper wire that goes from the enable pin over to the input pin. Now that the LED and regulator are both working, I decided it is time to load the header pins. By the way, I did need to shave the plastic on the headers just a little bit because they overlap on the three corners. To easily program the Pyramiduino with a PC's USB virtual COM port, we need to put a bootloader onto the ATmega 328P. The bootloader runs immediately after the processor has been reset or powers on. In the case of Arduino boards, it checks to see if the PC is trying to reprogram the flash memory. If so, the new program gets loaded, and if not, it hands over control to your program. In order to do this, we need to have an in-circuit programmer. They are designed to program the microcontroller after it's been loaded onto the board. I have this dedicated programmer, which we will use. The hardware programmer attaches to the SPI and reset pins on the Pyramiduino. In the Arduino IDE, we select the programmer type we are using and then select burn bootloader. That process was successful, so now we're ready to attach our USB to serial adapter. Keep in mind that most Arduino boards already have that built in. You might remember in the PCB episode that we designed the headers so that a USB to serial adapter could easily attach to the board like so. We just need to plug in the USB and head over to the IDE. I'm going to double check that the correct serial port is selected and then upload a program. Hmm, retry is not a good thing. And damn, it's the dreaded out of sync error. This error means the IDE cannot communicate with the board. A common mistake is to mix up the TX and RX, so let's load a program to print serial characters. Since the in-circuit programmer is working, we will use that to load the ASCII character table example. This Arduino example just prints out printable characters. When using a hardware programmer, select the Upload Using Programmer menu option. Okay, the first time I open the serial monitor, nothing happens. So in a moment of desperation, I opened it a second time, which showed some characters. So what's going on? Here's what I figured out. Each time the serial monitor is open, the board gets reset. The processor starts to run for a few cycles, which throws a few bytes into the PC's serial buffer, but then it just completely stops. This behavior makes me think something is wrong with auto reset. We should review how this simple looking auto reset circuit works. From the USB to serial adapter, there are three signals, transmit, 
receive, and DTR. Or you can also use RTS. This signal is active low, which means when it is active, it will go to zero volts. Over on the 328 side, there is a reset signal, which holds the processor in a stopped or reset state. It has a pull-up resistor to five volts. The reset signal is also active low, which means when zero volts or logic low is applied, the processor resets itself. It stays in that reset state until the signal goes high. These two signals are connected by a 100 nanofarad capacitor. When the serial port is closed, that means the capacitor sees five volts on the DTR side and five volts on the reset side. So when the computer opens the serial port, the USB to serial chip asserts the DTR signal, which causes one side of the capacitor to go low. This action drops five volts across the capacitor, causing it to start charging up. After a few milliseconds, the capacitor is charged and reset is brought back to five volts. This short time is what we call auto reset. It is just long enough to reset the 328, which then runs the bootloader. The scope is watching both RTS and reset. Watch what happens when the serial monitor is opened. Both signals are identical. We are not getting the curve on reset like we saw in the tutorial. My guess is that there's a short between them. Let's go look at the PCB layout. Almost immediately, I see the problem. Somehow, the design rule check missed this via. Or more likely, I ignored the warning. RTS and reset are shorted together. So we need to cut some traces and add yet another jumper wire. First, I scrape away that beautiful purple solder mask. Then I cut the trace on both sides of the RTS via, which isolates it from reset. Now I can run a jumper wire between the RTS via and the RTS header pin. I already reprogrammed the bootloader back onto the board, so let's go straight to programming over USB. And the upload works. I want to check the rest of the I.O. pins, so I wrote this program to toggle each pin one at a time. We could take the scope probe and go across each one individually. However, my scope has a logic analyzer built in, so we can see all of the pins at the same time. And what do you know, one of the I.O. pins is not working. I could take you through debugging this pin, but this episode is already getting pretty long, and at least with the scope information, I know where to look and can debug this board later. So tell you what, why don't we wrap up? In this episode, we got the boards back, we soldered parts onto them, and then we debugged a few problems, which were totally there for educational reasons only. So you might be wondering, what could you do with this Pyramidduino board? Well, if you would like to see an example, check out this live stream I did recently. The Pyramidduino was used to program a coin currency counter. Check the notes in the card above for links to that. That project will be featured in a future video. If you're not already, subscribe so you know when that video is released. You can find the full show notes over at adomes.com slash EP27. There you will find things like links to the KiCad and Arduino code files used in this episode and the entire series. If you have questions, leave them here or join the Adomes Discord server. Use the link on screen to redirect to that. Once again, thank you to Oshpark for making the boards used in this episode. One last question for you is, if you had a custom shaped Arduino board, what would you use it for? Let me know in the comments. And remember, if your circuit isn't working, just add ohms. Or jumper wire. Or two.